Edwin Gensler is a good friend on and off the tennis court. <laughs> Professor of Comparative Literature and Director of the Translation Center at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. He's the author of Translation and Identity in the Americas, 2007 publication, and Contemporary Translation Theories, uh, now in a revised second edition. He co-edited the anthology Translation and Power, 2002, which includes essays by many of the distinguished guests participating in the Translation Center's International Visitor Series. He serves as co-editor with Susan Bassnett uh, of the Topics and Translation Series for Multilingual Matters and is on the board of advisors to the Encyclopedia of Literary Translation by Fitzroy Dearborn Publishers in England. And uh, Edwin, please come. Thank you, Phil, and thanks to the uh, NIDA Institute for organizing this. Thanks to the College Board for opening up their rooms for us. Um, and especially thanks to everyone here in the audience. Um, there are some uh, very distinguished people who are here who I think uh, have uh, m much to contribute to the topics of today. And uh, I will try to be brief. Uh, I have a talk, but as you can see, it's mostly notes now. It's changed in the course of the day. I've never been to a conference where the two keynotes didn't read their papers and just spoke extemporaneously so uh, articulately and well. And then uh, Professor Berman now has uh, sort of given resumes of the papers that you didn't hear. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm not sure what's left for me to say. Uh, I do appreciate how intimate this space has been, and I think this smaller gathering is, is, is really quite good. Uh, and uh, I'd like to uh, begin with a, a little bit of background about me. I, I, I was raised an atheist in a small steel town in Ohio. Uh, my father read Sartre and Camus. And he helped me out of catechisms and helped me out of religion being taught in the schools. I had to sit in the hallways all alone. And for the life of me, I don't know why I get invited to events organized by the NIDA Institute. <laughs> but as a translation studies scholar, and uh, Anthony mentioned this a little bit in his talk, there is no text that's been translated more times into more cultures. There is a, there's a vast, there's probably been no text that's inculturated uh, more and better into all sorts of different uh, cultures. Uh, this summer school that I've gone to a few times now in Masano is just wonderful. The Bible translators speak African language, indigenous American languages, uh, di dialects or other languages of uh, India, uh, 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 aboriginal languages uh, in, the, uh, in Canada. It's, in my university we teach 13 languages. Um, to be able to share some ideas on translation theory, translation methodology with people with such an enormous wealth of experience in the field has just been uh, terrifically enriching. So I hope that this uh, dialogue continues and I hope they keep inviting me to come and, <laughs> come and talk to them. If you haven't uh, considered the summer school in Masano, let me tempt you, it is beautiful. It's right on the Adriatic Sea. And the conversations go deep into the night. Um, it's also a joy to be here in New York City and one of the uh, probably most important weekends in this city in a decade. Um, and to experience the strength and energy and compassion and regenerative powers of the city. I don't know if you've been down to the World Trade Center site, but um, it's quite remarkable now. There's uh, waterfalls and pools and oak trees growing. It's an interactive site. It's not a monument or a memorial that you 
look at like a statue of Stalin or something. It's, it's very much alive and I think open to the next generation. It's very sort of forgiving, understanding, uh, regenerative. And um, I don't know if I want to get into the Mona Baker debate in the field of translation studies, but it's been <coughs> terrifically destructive for our field. And I'm hoping maybe a decade later, all of us can move beyond this. Um, the Niner Institute did ask me about uh, talking to Mona Baker about St. Jerome and its distribution system, which is very good. And um, I said that there's no way that Mona Baker will agree to uh, work with you. Um, for ideological reasons, and the fact that they've been able to negotiate this and work this out and work out an agreement, I see as a great healing step for our field. So I don't know who did that uh, wheeling and dealing, uh, uh, Stephen or Duane or Dean Towner, but you did a wonderful job, and it's, it, I think it will be healing for our profession. I can't read my own writing. Um, where to begin? This had several titles. I've got about four of them now. But I think it'll now be in Inculturation, a Double Bind. <laughs> it seems to be the topic of the day. So I work in cultural studies and translation. So the use of inculturation has been a central focus for the branch of the field since its inception in the early 1990s. Now, I, maybe it's my lack of understanding of uh, Catholic and biblical discourse on translation, but the term I think is very good, but it's very new to me. I, I don't think I've heard it before. So um, those who have taken the cultural turn in translation studies, Bastant, Lefebvre, Trivedi, Simon Cronin, Venuti, all have turned to cultural studies scholars, the Marxist feminist deconstructionist post-colonial scholars, to supplement the descriptive theories and to uh, access tools uh, to help not just describe translations, but to explain them. The goal is not to further categorize, no matter how large the computer memories inventories grow but rather to enter into the vagarities and vicissitudes of translations and include all translation activities, no matter how minute, marginal, lesser known, different, including exceptions as well as the rules. This is why the advisory board to the new journal Translation has such a diverse array of scholars, including philosophers, historians, linguists, semioticians, comparatists, anthropologists, feminists, theologists, liberation theologists, men and women, scholars from first and third world. To be frank, translation studies as a discipline with its emphasis on empirical studies, scientific discourses, universal norms, computer-generated corpi, does not go far enough to provide the scholars with the array of tools necessary to investigate the complexity of translation in this postmodern, post-structural, and as Nerard and Arduini phrase it, post-translational age. I think Anthony Pym is exactly right in suggesting uh, that uh, the, uh, the church, with a capital C, I assume he means the Catholic Church, has vested interest when they enter the field of translation studies. I think that uh, Professor Spivak is very much exactly right to play the gender and subaltern card, showing how universalizing, globalizing discourse limit and marginalize alternative. If you could fill that in a little bit. Uh, um, and then um, you implicate uh, Christian institutions with those colonizing and imperial forces uh, that are very much involved in the spread of modernity. Um, I guess my question is, and you suggest that some of the people on the board may not be aware of uh, the, um, the affiliation with the NIDA Institute and, and the journal. Uh, 
I guess my question, does dialogue imply collusion? Does collaboration suggest co-option? Um, so those are a couple of questions for uh, Professor Pym. Um, I think both the Pym and Spivak papers strike me as very much concerned with who writes the master history and what happens to alternative histories. What happens to Arabic cultures and laws? What happens to tribal cult cultures and systems of justice? What happens to indigenous religions? What happens to women? If the master history is written by the white, heterosexual, Christian male capitalist, <laughs> who or what is excluded? What happens to alternative constructions of society, gender, and race? Pim's answers, as I can see them, and, and, and uh, uh, Sandra Berman summarized this better than I can. Um, Pim's answers the questions in his paper about the movement of modern ideas and models it, it is quite incomplete and unnecessarily, or necessarily contradictory, invoking a combination of national interests and individual agency. Efforts by individual authors, editors, translators, a mingling of tears, armies stationed abroad, access to technology and the media, in this case a London publishing house and its commercial national interest, and in the example that he cites a former major in the British military stationed in Calcutta as an editor. He uses this term enculturation as coined adopted by Pope John Paul II to refer how the Catholic Church envisions the service of translation to their mission, making religious inroads into a culture, inculturation, incarnation, ingestation. The choice is a perfect topic for today and in this environment, just perfect for this meeting and this combination of scholars. So thank you very much. It well represents what I'm going to call the first wave of cultural studies scholars in translation. The questions that predominated this really two decades of investigating issues of translation and power were more or less these. Which texts are selected for translation and by whom? How are they translated? Who does the translation and why? How are the translators compensated? What form of collusion exists between publishers and translators? How can a translator resist collusion? How do translated texts enter a new culture? Who reads them? Why? Who reviews them? Why? How do we measure the success of a translation? These are all questions that uh, Pim gives rise to in his talk, and they do represent uh, 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 a very important generation of scholarship in the field. Um, of recent, we're suggesting that translation studies uh, need move to a post-translation phase. This new wave of scholarship adds dimensions. The goal is to look at post-translation effects on the cultural environment on creative writing, on art, on architecture, on cultural construction, on evolution, on the churches, on the political uh, fields. My guess is that without translation, no American Revolution, no liberation movements in Latin America, no communist revolutions in Southeast Asia, no fall of the Berlin Wall, no quiet revolution in Canada, no Arab Spring. In Cities in Translation, forthcoming Sherry Simon gives the, the illusion that without the fertile translation culture and the dynamic multilingual pre-translation environment in Calcutta, Calcutta no Tagore, uh, without bilingual multilingual Prague, no Kafka, which comes first? The revolution, then the translation, or the translation, then the revolution? Which is more powerful, the pen or the sword? Translation can be viewed as a 
preconditioned, the environmental foundation upon which all cultural constructions, creative writing, translation, architecture, streets, bridges, churches, are founded. I have argued in a book I wrote a couple of years ago that translation is not something that happens between languages, but is constitutional of those very languages. And I think this connects to the uh, glissant section of uh, Sandra Behrman's paper. The goal today, as I see it, is to discuss the idea that translation is not a subdiscipline of linguistics or comparative literature or a subdiscipline of any individual language, nor is it a discipline in and of itself, <coughs> nor is it a communication problem that a church hierarchy has to solve. Rather, translation, I suggest, is a cultural condition underlying all language, something ingrained in the psyche of all individuals, something constitutional of individual identities within a culture, a basis upon which their language, their worldview, their gender derives. Yes, it has been appropriated and used in, by any number of institutions of power, churches, governments, universities, private presses, for specific ideological purposes. Cultural studies is getting quite good at describing those manipulations at work. The question remains as to how does this process also simultaneously distort what has been left out? What are the cultural repercussions of those absences? Thus, Gayatri's conception of gender in translation, gender and identity formed through a translational process from infancy, as one acquires language, concepts with and still without cultural connotations, all a process of translation that might be closer to the conception of post-translation in the new journal. So let me turn to some questions for Professor Spivak. One of them was asked by my student already. I'm so proud of it. But I asked, uh, I guess I phrased it like this. I think my student phrased it better than I did. Speaking of utopias, I can see a leveling of the plane in terms of economics, equal pay for equal work, especially in light of multinational capitalism. But if gender is a social construction, then I would guess that gender is constructed differently in different parts of the world. And then what are the dangers of translating difference into some sort of global equivalence? And I think you answered that quite eloquently already this morning. Um, the question of agency arises. The probing, mediating processes of gendering and translating. If gender is a no place, and I, I, I like the way you sort of define gender as a no place for us. If access to the original is impossible, then how can a feminist translator proceed and what liberties are permitted? I am sure you have had this question often in the past. Mm -hmm. And this is a question that uh, Professor Nergaard and I asked during the uh, lunchtime interview, but it had to do with love and intimacy in translation. And I, I think I phrased it better at the, uh, in the interview than I phrased it here. But rather, an either or, either domesticate or foreignize in translation, which strikes me as a kind of a academic, rational, uh, methodological approach. Um, Professor Spivak talks about intimacy in translation and reading. Translation is the most uh, intimate act of reading. And it strikes me that this is a third way. This is not one or the other. It might be both, it might be neither. Um, but it strikes me as if uh, there's a giving oneself over to the psychological, emotional connections and interconnections with the text, the author, and the culture. And uh, so this is how I phrase the question. Can you envision thinking about translation of spiritual discourse as interrelated to your work. Mm 
Benjamin's Judaism, Nida's Christianity, Tagore's Buddhism. And then uh, this is probably a question for both uh, Professor Pym and Spivak. The question of history keeps coming up, always historicize. Undermining conceptions of utopias, gender, and translation. How does Professor Pym's written a wonderful book on methodologies of writing translational histories? Um, how does one go about unpacking those layers of hidden, encrypted, erroneous terms and concepts embedded in the construction of gender, embedded in the construction of translated texts? 